These are very bad chairs. Do you agree? They're, I could fall asleep right exactly. now. Exactly. They're too comfortable. You shouldn't have chairs this low for interviews. They should perch you and sort of, you see what I mean? Like I usually use bar stools. So yeah. when it gets really boring and you all fall asleep, it's not our fault, right? <laughs> we could ask for pieces of wood to put in here. Well, and keep here's us. something, though. Maybe we should just stand up. Oh, that's good. That's very <laughs> good. Enough. Very good. Get it. <laughs> I'm going to go and see if there's a better chair. <laughs> right. If I really like someone, they can come up here. <laughs> ah, that's better. That's much better. <laughs> I feel perky, perky, perky. How is this book tour treating you? You've been to hell and gone for the brutal, past few weeks. Brutal. We came to New York, we had two days in New York, Washington, Boston, Chicago, uh, Kansas City, Denver, Vancouver, Victoria, Seattle, and here. I can't believe you can remember all those. Well, it was, uh, and I think I did those in, in, a, in just under two weeks. So you just get pretty tired, you really can, do. Yeah. Mainly because on those planes now, the seats are so small. I mean, they're all right. You're a decent size. You're not huge, but you're not tiny, right? It's true. They so fit you're me very okay. Well. They fit you. I'm miserable. Oh. I, I always think of those uh, bamboo cages that the North Koreans... <laughs> With the water up to here? Yes, yeah, that's right. So you couldn't get comfortable, right? They yes. used to keep our pilots in them when they caught them. Kafka uh, called it something. Like the, 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 Kafka talked about it in uh, the penal colony. It was this box that you couldn't get comfortable in. Yeah, yeah. Just and like that. It's just like that. So I have to sit there for two hours uh, being uncomfortable and then get in a car. And they always get me a small car so that I can't <laughs> sit up straight. So by the time I get to the hotel, you know, I'm kind of... And I'm 75 anyway, for God's sake. You look damn good for 75. 75, thank you. I don't want to make you feel old with this comment, because you are old, but... No, no, I'm very old. I'm very old. Well, 75 is nearly dead. <laughs> for most of human history, it's yeah, way past it's dead. Way past, way yeah. past dead. Methuselah. Absolutely. I want to tell but you... But then, it's not such a bad thing because most of the best people are dead. <laughs> right? It's true. But most of the people you and I would like to meet most, like Plato, right? Who would Feynman, you want, who Richard would you Feynman. Want to, who, who is dead that you'd really like to meet? Well, Richard Feynman, Da Vinci. Feynman? Yeah. Yes, wonderful man. Did One, you ever meet him? No, but I, I just... He's got this incredibly... Um, positive attitude when things went wrong. Whereas most of us think, oh, fuck you, know, what are we doing? <laughs> and, and Feynman would say, now that's interesting. Yeah. And I think that's the most wonderful attitude. My, my favorite last words, <clears throat> an 18th century woman, she was vaguely upper class, and I don't know her name because she wasn't famous, but just before she died, she announced to the people in the room who were waiting for her to die, it's all been most interesting. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What a great thing to be able what to say. What a great thing to be able to say, exactly. That's awesome. I, I wanted to tell you that uh, I'm sure you've been peppered with all sorts of memories people have of the first time they saw you. The memory that I have is that watching Monty Python was the first time I was laughing with my parents. Oh! <laughs> That's so touchy. It made me feel so grown up, and I've been searching for that ever since. You know, I, I find it very touching because a lot, particularly in America, a lot of men have said 
that it was the only thing that they really connected with their dads on, which is sad in a way, but at least they had that. Yeah. And, uh, well, you, you see what I'm saying? And, yeah. and, and I love that. In fact, that one, of the, one of my failures, which was Fierce Creatures, was an attempt to make a movie specifically for children to watch with their parents. Well, that was what I was trying to do, and everyone thought I was trying to make Fish Call Wonder again. But I think that's lovely. I think when people laugh together. Exactly. Hey, it made me feel like I was having a connection with them. I just remember that's being right. unhinged and not being able... We're trying not to laugh so we can hear the next line. Yes. We're yes. choking. Yeah, that's wonderful. I can't remember many things. The only, the only real connection I had with my mum was that we laughed at the same things. And it was very odd because on the whole... Um, let me tell you a story which amuses me about professional comedians. W.C. Fields is one of the greatest comedians ever, and I don't think young people know him as well as they should. He was absolutely wonderful. And somebody said to him once, he, they asked him about a professional comedian's sense of humor. And, and uh, W.C. Fields said, well, um, for most people, if an actor dresses up as a very, very, very old woman, and walks along the street, you know, like this, and falls down a manhole, they'll laugh. <laughs> but to make a professional comedian laugh, it really has to be an old woman. <laughs> you, have a, you have an anecdote in the book about making your mom laugh with a yeah. really dark joke. Yes, well, she, she was a very anxious and neurotic woman and when I um, when I would telephone her um, and she, she, she lived until 101 um, so I saw quite a lot of her over the years um, <laughs> I would ring up or always made the call and I said hello mum and she said oh hello John how are you and I would say I'm fine mother how are you and she would always say with a, with a, a hint of surprise she would say well I've I've been just a little bit down this week. And, you know, I don't know why she was surprised, because she was a little bit down this week for 50 fucking years. <laughs> uh, uh, one, one year, I said, one, one day, I just spontaneously, it just came to, because you don't like it when your mother's unhappy. You no. want her to be happy, you know? And, you know, if you're with a depressive, it's very difficult. It's hard to cheer them up. But on this occasion, I had a moment of utter creative inspiration because I said to her, Mother, I have an idea. And she said, oh, what is that? And I said, well, Mother, if you're still feeling this way next week, I know a little man in Fulham. And if you, if you like, but only if you like, I could give him a call and he could come down there and kill you. wandering around handing out bits of paper. <laughs> what did he give you? Yeah, a oh, a questionnaire. Oh, now I understand. Oh, I thought he was asking you for money, and I won't. <laughs> uh, and then, so from, from then on, any time she started to say that she was not very happy, I'd just wait a couple of minutes, and then I'd say, so should I, should I call the little man from Fulham? And she'd laugh every time and say things like, oh, no, I've got a sherry party on Friday. <laughs> In the book you describe, there's this moment before she laughs where you wonder if you've gone too far. <laughs> yes. But that's where everything <laughs> lies, right? In that's that pause. Right. In that pause. I did wonder whether I'd gone too far, and I sometimes, I sometimes do. <laughs> I had two very nice women assistants in London. This is about 20 years ago. They were late 20s or early 30s. I was very fond of both of them, Melanie and, and, and Hen no, Amanda, Amanda and Henrietta. And the most extraordinary thing happened, which is that in a period of two weeks, both of their current boyfriends were killed in accidents. Oh. One in a car accident, one in a motorcycle accident. And I walked in a week after that into the office and, and just said, 
Uh, anyone dead today I should know about? You see? <laughs> I can't, I can't behave myself. But the interesting thing <laughs> was the, the, <laughs> the best part is, no matter how mad they get, when they tell the story to someone else, they're going to be like, what did you expect? <laughs> yes, that's right. But what was interesting was one of them fell about laughing, and the other one burst into tears. It was a very strange... <laughs> And it all depends when you get into that kind of humor. There's some people who can stand back from it a little bit more and see it <clears throat> a little bit like a cartoon, right? Yeah. So that if, um, if uh, Jerry runs Tom over with a steamroller, the most sensitive people in the audience won't be able to laugh because they will be thinking how that cat must be suffering. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. So that, and when we made a fish called Wanda, and one of the dogs was flattened by a car, and the audience is falling about. Originally, we shot a close-up, and the director had got some a bucket of innards from a local butcher, <laughs> and had put these innards on this sort of raffia mat squash dog. <laughs> And the audience is roaring with laughter, and when that close-up went up on the stage, they stopped like that. <laughs> because it, it reminded them of the reality of a dog being... I mean, you can laugh at the idea of it. It's quite different from the reality of it. So we replaced it with a stupid raffia mat and no blood at all. And then the audience was able to laugh. That's it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Somebody loved that story. <laughs> or something else happened that we don't know about. <laughs> you talk in the book about the need to, to have the right attitude about failure, about yeah. being willing to approach that gulf where you're not sure how people are going to react. What do you mean having the right attitude towards failure? Well, a lot of people are terrified of making mistakes. And um, as I point out, as I sometimes talk to businesses, if you try to avoid mistakes by just doing the same thing again and again because it's worked in the past, you'll make the worst mistake of all, which is that the other companies around you will overtake you. So not making a mistake will turn out to be a huge mistake. And Peter Drucker said that the, the greatest danger was, was, was rigidity if yeah. people were too frightened of making mistakes. Because if you're going to do something new, some of those tries are not going to work. There was an interesting piece by um, Paul Krugman in the, in the New York Times this morning. And he made the point about investments that even the best people, like Warren Buffett, they occasionally make a bad investment. Because there's an element of risk if you try to do something new and creative. And uh, a lovely film uh, a theatrical director in London said that when he was rehearsing a show, if there wasn't a moment when he thought this could be a disaster, then it was never a great show. Because yeah. it, you're right? Yeah, totally. Because there's a moment, what was it Karl Popper said, it's impossible to uh, foresee all the consequences of our actions. And that's particularly true if, if audiences are concerned. I mean, there's the moment... The moment you feel like you've got everything wired is the moment life is about to kick you in the balls. Absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely yeah. right, yeah. And you can see it happening to people. They really begin to think that they know. And uh, that's, that they're that's dangerous. Yeah. And that they're special. Yes, <laughs> that they're special. There's a wonderful bit of research. You know Philip Tetlock? Have you no. come across this guy? No. It's mentioned in The Black Swan, which is the most interesting book I've read for years. And Tetlock wanted to find out whether these pundits, these experts on politics and economics, could make good forecasts. So he went to them and he asked them a large number of questions about what was going to happen in five years time and ten years time. And the fascinating thing was that they were all hopeless. <laughs> but the people who were most hopeless, and I think this is fascinating, were the most famous ones. Because when you have an idea, right, you have the affirmative bias, yes. which is that if you have an idea and then you get two bits of information, one of them confirming what you think and one of them disproving it. 
you're much more likely to accept the one, right? Oh, yeah. So that means that you want something that affirms your bias or your, your, your prejudice. And the bigger your ego, the more certain you are that you're right and that you don't need to look at all the feedback coming in, only the feedback that proves that you're right. And that's why they were the worst people. Totally hopeless at guessing anything. Anything. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's a lovely realization. I mean, <laughs> this, is my, this is what my third book's going to be about. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's going to be called Why There Is No Hope. <laughs> You've been saying this on this book yeah, tour. I, I have, because I just got interested. It's not in this book, which, oh. Where is that book? <laughs> <laughs> I left it in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get Howard, my, my uh, lovely friend, to bring it in l later on. What was I talking about? Uh, yeah, it's just the idea, which I began to get reading The Black Swan. And I think you, 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 I think you know a great deal more about this than I do, really, although you're politely pretending you don't, <laughs> is that, it, is that you, we don't know what's going to happen. And that I would take, go from there to another thing, because when I started to write a couple of books about psychology with my old therapist, who was really quite famous, I said to him one day, I said, what percentage of therapists in this country do you think that really know what they're doing? He said 10. <laughs> he said 10%. And after that, every time I met someone that I thought this person is special, I, I said to them, how many people in your field know what they're doing? The lowest I got was five. The highest I ever got was 20. Most people said 10 to 15. Thank you. Thank you, John. Most people said 10 to 15 percent of the people in their business really knew what they were doing. The rest of them just applied a set set of rules. But if they didn't work those rules, they're like me when the computer goes wrong. They don't know what to do next. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's an extraordinary thought, that six out of seven people have no idea what they're doing. Well, and moreover... <laughs> you don't disagree with me, do I you? don't disagree with you at all. I think that one of the things that we <laughs> spend a lot of time doing, what a lot of those experts spend a lot of time doing, is try to hope that they know what's coming next. Yes. Because not knowing what's coming next is, well, it's genuinely terrifying. It is, ger until you give up, till you give up hope, which is what, what I'm hoping, I mean... <laughs> encouraging you all to do, but once you say we don't have a fucking clue what's going on, we don't know what's going to happen, then you can just get on quietly with your life and enjoying a nice glass of wine and making as much money as you need, but not, not, not more. And, and, um, and, and the basic principle, which is trying to be kind to people, just a small number, because you can affect a small number. <laughs> if you try and change the world, I mean, it's, it's terribly funny that you think that people are going out there to try and change the world. You know, it's, it's pointless. <laughs> I wasn't planning to get here so early, <laughs> but... <laughs> Incidentally, the book is called So Anyway. Sorry, go on. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, are you a closet Buddhist? Um, I, I'm a closet something. <laughs> I actually think that there's something going on. I was part of a group that studied it, and we produced a book called Irreducible Mind. Have you ever come across it? I have. It's a highly academic tome, <clears throat> but I don't think it's all, things are all explained by the materialist reductionist view of science. And I don't know how you can hang on to that since, uh, since quantum theory was accepted, which is quite clearly saying that there isn't a reality without consciousness being involved in it. Do you right. see what I mean? Yeah. So I think, I think we, we don't really know anything yet. And I think the people who say they're going to produce an artificial mind that's like a human mind, I think they're delusional. I really do. Do you agree or not? I'm not sure if I've thought all the way through to them being delusional. I'm fascinated by what they're going to discover as they try. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. But I want them also to look at other evidence. Well, I mean, the fact of our sentience is completely astonishing. The fact of what? Our sentience. I mean, I, I'm, I, am, I, I have a mind for science, and I definitely am reductionist about most things. All right. But I also understand at the end of every line of question, the answer is we don't know. Yes. What's That's gravity? Right. We don't Who know. Who knows? And one of the most, um, one of the most depressing 
things that anyone ever said to me. I was having dinner with a small group of people who included, um, was it Philip J. Gould, the biologist? Have I got the name? Stephen J. Gould. Stephen J. Gould. <clears throat> Stephen J. Gould. And I was asking, he was a very nice guy, and Richard Dawkins was there too. And uh, we always wondered whether they were going to squabble, and they didn't. They behaved very well, both of <laughs> them. So I asked uh, Stephen J. Gould, I said, what was the, um, I said, what, what do you, what, tell me what you're working on. And he told me in great detail about four books that he wanted to write. And he was absolutely clear what these books were and what was going to be. And I said, now, if you now met God and God said to you, I will answer one question, what would you ask him? What would you ask him that's something that you've always wanted to understand that you don't understand yet? And he said, <clears throat> I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is a scientist. And he really thinks he knows it all. I was shocked. Oh, wow, that's why he said he couldn't think of it. I would imagine he would be embarrassed for choice. I mean, well, yes, exactly. I would, I would have no idea where to begin. No, no, it's exactly the point, is we know so little. And I just ask people, just keep an open mind about all the things that are going on. So you wrote a book called Irreducible Mind. Yeah, well, I, I financed it, but the, there were a lot of uh, academics. That... Was this with the think tank at Esalen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Michael Murphy is a pal of mine. Yeah. They're lovely people. They're absolutely lovely. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people there, for example, who, who worked with them, oh, God, what was the name of the guy at the University of Virginia, Stevenson, who did all, all the reincarnation research. And, and it's, it's, when you finish reading it, it's hard to say it's all coincidence, you know? Hmm. So I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the mechanisms are. And I think the danger is when you start trying to pretend you know what the mechanisms are. But I know there's something. Somebody said recently to me that coincidences are what are left over when the theory isn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> what do you I, think of that? I, I, I like that. You, something you said earlier reminded me that Richard Feynman said that science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. <laughs> That's wonderful, because I would love to make a film about all the fuck-ups. <laughs> I mean, a, a cardiologist said to me in London just last year, a top heart guy, he said, we got it wrong. For 60 years, they've been saying that heart problems are caused by eating fats. He said, it's not fats, it's sugar. Oh, crap. Yeah? <laughs> <clears throat> I, if there's one thing I like more than fat, it's sugar. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me too. <laughs> me too. It's bad news. Oh, but, I mean, the point is, for 60 years, they were out there telling everyone to avoid fats, and everything was based on this, and now they've decided, oh, no, we got that wrong. Sorry. <laughs> but that's like we are, right? I mean, hmm. I, I was saying to one of my kids, I said, think about yourself five, four years ago. You know, they're 15. I was like, yeah, and I said, think about what an idiot you were. Yes. Compared to now. I was like, yeah, and I said, that's going to keep happening for the yes. rest of your yeah. life. <laughs> I think it was Mark Twain who said he'd never realized what an idiot was till he was 15, and he had a long conversation with his father. But he was surprised. <laughs> When he, got, when he got to the age of 20, he was surprised at how much his father had learned in the previous time. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, now, this book. <laughs> yes, about this book. Oh, really? Because I was going to ask about lemurs. Oh, ask about lemurs. What is it with the lemurs? Oh, I just think they're the nicest little creatures. I wish I'd married one. It would have simplified... <laughs> Would have simplified my life. They are the dearest, dearest little things. And I see one of them's carrying, uh, I've seen an advertisement for a movie. And, oh no, it's a raccoon, isn't it? It's a raccoon, that's right. No, I just love lemurs and I think they're absolutely adorable. So I do a little bit to help because they are getting wiped out in, in Madagascar. It's the only place, this huge island. And because we think it's small, can we look at the map next to Africa? It's the size of France. And, and those 30, they keep discovering various species. In fact, I have a species named after me. No. Yes. A Latin, Latin. Yes. 
Avahi Klesii, Klesis Woolly Lima. Isn't that wonderful? That's fantastic. Lovely. And I turned down a peerage. <laughs> I think you have your priorities I got order. my priorities right, didn't I? And I've got a Lima named after me, so when I paid off the alimony, I must give them something. <laughs> so about this book. Yes. You... you <laughs> You started Often zero before we mentioned it. I love that. <laughs> you started zero, and you, you take it right to the first Python performance. Yes, that's right. Does that mean you're planning on a sequel? Oh, I should do a couple more. <laughs> this only gets to the first. But people have said, uh, some people have said, well, I, we thought it was all going to be about Python. And I got slightly embarrassed. I said to the publisher, have we misled people? He said, no. He said, if you were going to write a book about Monty Python, it would be called Monty Python by John Cleese. If it's an autobiography, people will expect to be about your childhood and your parents and your schooling and all that stuff. So what, from a, from a Python point of view, it's, it's sort of showing how my sense of humor developed over the first 30 years. And it's the, I recount the very first Python recording when Michael Palin and I were sort of standing in the wings watching Graham Chapman and Terry Jones about to do a sketch about flying sheep. And I looked at Michael and I said, do you realize we could be the first comedians ever to record a show to complete silence? <laughs> <laughs> and Michael nodded and said I was having the same thing. <laughs> So it was as risky as that when we started. Wow. We didn't know. Then there's a little bit at the end about the O2 show, uh, which we did in July, because it was interesting, the sort of bookends, you know, from the, from the very beginning of Python, and then to talk, you know, it was 69, and then talk about 2014, <coughs> and how utterly, utterly different the shows were. I mean, one was a tiny little private TV thing that was put on late at night, and some, some weeks the BBC would cancel it and put on show jumping instead, I remember. <laughs> um, and then suddenly we're in the... Uh, in the this is a, a lovely theatre. This is a fabulous... It's just a great size. We, we were in one 16 times bigger than this. You could, it just went back and back and back, and it was just amazing. Because they, they were all Python fans, and that was... That's... Were they reciting along the lines? With... Yeah, they knew the script better than we did, you know. <laughs> there was a case one a time when I was in New York once, and, and uh, I knew how the audience knew it, and Michael... Uh, threw me completely with, a, with an ad lib in the Dead Parrots game. Yeah. Uh, he offered me a slug to replace the parrot. <laughs> and I said, does it talk? And he was supposed to say, not really, but he said, well, it's been muttering a bit tonight. <laughs> and by the time I'd recovered, I'd forgotten where I was. <laughs> and I was so relaxed, like tonight. If you have a great audience, you get very relaxed. I said, just said to the front row, I said, what's the next line? <laughs> <laughs> they all shouted it out. <laughs> and I said, what is the point of this? You paid good money to see me perform. You know the fucking sketch better than I do. So that's... A, I was wondering, the characters you guys am, uh, took on to do something like the parrot sketch are very specific. Um, 30 years after the last live performance, when you go to the O2, does Michael go back into the exact same character and so do you, or do those get modified over the years? I don't think they get modified much. I think my voice has dropped a little bit as I got more relaxed rather than because I got older. I think there used to be a tightness in my voice, which I think a certain amount of therapy helped, helped to clear. But otherwise, going into them, oh, yes, that's right, we had, a, we had dinner with Jean-Paul Sartre. I like his wife. He's a bit gloomy, Jean-Paul, you know. He talked a lot about existentialism. You see what I mean? I can really just go straight back into it. And uh, it, it's peculiar, that. Um, but the certain characters, if you played characters a, 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 a great deal, it's as though they continue to exist somewhere in you. 
and you can just connect with that place and go, even the gestures will be right. It's a real thing. It's, it's a consciousness. A, it's You've, a real consciousness. Yeah. And I think sometimes when, when uh, authors say that a character that they're writing takes over the book, I think that that happens. I think when you're writing a character sometime, if you're an actor playing a new character, you try to feel it. You try to feel it. And then you do something in rehearsal. And you suddenly think, ooh, that felt right. And then maybe an hour later you do something else. You go, ooh, that felt... And so you've got two points on the graph. And then ever so slowly you try and join it up and have other moments. And then you have less and less of the part feels wrong. And then eventually, with any luck, you, you feel that you own all of that part. And at that point, you could go straight back in. Wow. But it's, it's so much more than memory, because the gestures and the physical, you know, how you sit and all yeah. this kind of thing is... is... Uh, Quentin Tarantino said while he was writing Jackie Brown that uh, a key plot point in Jackie Brown is that she keeps going to Ordell and telling him the whole plan even while she's double-crossing him. And Quentin said, every time she did that, I was surprised. <laughs> he was writing it. But the character That's one has thing. its own motivation. And this is what happens. You know, you start, when we started out writing Basil Faultry, for example, which we wrote six hours of him, you see, 12 half hours. At the beginning, it took a little time to feel what was right for him and what was, and then by the end, he so much existed almost outside our control that we knew exactly the sort of thing he would do. And I think people don't, don't, don't understand that, how that, that can happen. That's a wonderful story about, about Tarantino, how this character becomes so real to you that a part of you that you're not really conscious of utterly tunes in on him. And then your unconscious starts making him behave right. Yeah. That's extraordinary. It has its own logic. But yeah. it, the, I think one of the main things I got from the, the book, I was going to say the novel, <clears throat> the book that I didn't know it was that you are a writer, first and foremost. I've and always thought of, of myself as a writer. writer. Yes. Yeah. It was a, I got to Cambridge on, on uh, science and switched to law because I wasn't really interested in science. And um, I just discovered one day by chance that if I, if I was given a, a sheet of blank paper, I could write something down, and that if somebody, perhaps myself, not necessarily performed it right, people would laugh. And it was an astonishing discovery to me. But from the very beginning, I was always performing what I'd written. And if you actually look back over the things people know me from, which is Python and, and Faulty Towers and Fish Called Wanda, all of those I wrote or co-wrote myself, yeah. you know. And the only thing I've ever done, the only big movie I've ever done, uh, which was written by someone else, was, was written by Michael Frayn, who wrote Noises Off, do you remember? Mm -hmm. And Michael wrote a, a, a movie called Clockwise. And I'm very pleased to find now that a lot of people, especially in Canada, know about this movie because it did no business at all when it came out. But it's just called Clockwise, and it's about a headmaster who has a very important speech to make to all the other headmasters, and he gets on the wrong train. And it's just a series of disasters. <laughs> And it's very good, except for the last three minutes. But up to that, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you said that the, the, the tension that existed among the pythons while writing existed within the writing, but not within the performance. No, that was the bizarre thing, you know, because we did fight and argue a lot. And the arguments were always about the script. Was the script good enough? And we never argued about who was going to play what role. Because as writers, it was quite obvious to be written something. Well, obviously, Graham's going to play that. Eric will play that. Michael will play that. It was, it's obvious. We never argued about that. But when we got into, the, into arguing about the script, we used to get <clears throat> extremely worked up. <clears throat> much too much stuff. Much too much stuff. But one of the problems was there were two really difficult people in the group. The first was, was Terry Jones. And the second was me. And we used to butt heads, and it was sort of temperamental, because T Terry, um, I don't usually say this in public, but <clears throat> it is sort of known, Terry is Welsh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I once explained to, to Terry that God had put the Welsh on the planet 
to carry out menial tasks for the English. <laughs> and he, was, he could never get his mind around this. He could never, and insisted on behaving as though he was an equal. You know? and, uh, so there were a lot of fights with Terry. Did you guys end up fighting over the same territory? Or was it... No, it was just whether something was funny. I mean, this is how ridiculous it got. And there's a story in the book. Um, we, some, we, somebody had written a funny sketch set in a dormitory. And then somebody said, yeah, it should be a very sort of dusty, run-down kind of place. And somebody said, yes, but with one magnificent Louis XIV chandelier. <laughs> And somebody said, yeah, that's funny, but not a chandelier, a dead, stuffed farm animal <laughs> with a light bulb in each one of its four feet. <laughs> and somebody said, um, obviously a sheep. <laughs> and somebody said, what do you mean a sheep? And the guy said, well, obviously it's funnier if it's a sheep. And somebody said, no, it's much funnier if it's a goat. <laughs> Very so he said, a woolly chandelier, that's hilarious. He said, no, no, the goat is much funnier visual gag with the horns, you see. And this argument went on, and I remember quite seriously, it went on for a quarter of an hour. Three were passionate that it should be a sheep. Three were passionate that it should be a goat. And I remember I sort of sat back and I thought, this is insane. What are we arguing about? It's Obvious, it's got to be a fucking goat. What are you <laughs> Now, it, there was a lot, a lot of passion went into that. I can see. You know, it was ridiculous. But you have, I remember reading um, after Meaning of Life came out that you guys, I don't know if I've got this correct because I'm going back to my brain at that point, mm -hmm. but did you guys write that in Hawaii? No, we wrote a bit of it in the West Indies. What happened was that after Life of Brian, which the Pythons all feel is, is very much our best show. Hello. Oh, thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Our very much our best uh, film. And I agree. I think the first half, thank you. I think the first half of, of Life of um, uh, Holy Grail is very, very, very good. But I don't think the second half is hot. Whereas uh, Life of Brian, there was a real, there was a real story there. And I was so, and it was about something important too. And um, when we got to Meaning of Life, we could never agree on a story. And we kept meeting and writing for a month. We had masses of material, and nothing could come together to unify it. So we all went off where we'd been to finish Life of Brown. We went off to the West Indies. Oh, okay. For uh, 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 two weeks. And I said on the first night, I said, I have a plan. And they said, what, what? I said, let's not do any work at all. Let's just have a wonderful holiday on the beach in the sun and then go back to everyone and say, we're very disappointed, we just couldn't put it together. <laughs> <laughs> and I just about won the argument. And then that little Welsh bastard <laughs> <laughs> came down the next day and said, well, well, yeah, I was thinking last night, I really think. And he, he had put all the different sketches into the sort of stages of life. And I remember my sense of disappointment. I thought, oh, God, we're going to have to make this fucking film now. <laughs> and uh, he was entirely responsible. It was his determination. Otherwise, we would have had a wonderful holiday. Life of Brian does contain, I think, what might be my single favorite Python joke, which is, you're all different. <laughs> That's the one. That is the greatest. That is the greatest joke of all. <laughs> he comes out and he's, he's decided he's going to pretend to be the Messiah. I think that's right. And, he, and they, they say, tell us. He says, you've all got to think it out for yourselves. And he, they all chorus. Yes, we've all got to think it out for ourselves. <laughs> and then he says, you're all individuals. And they shout, Yes, we're all individuals. And then one guy says, I'm not. <laughs> and then the, all the others go, shh. <laughs> I love that joke, but I, I'm asking you seriously, am I right in thinking it has no meaning? 
the joke? The joke. To me, the joke that is, if the Buddha loved comedy, yes, that would be that his would be the one joke. he loved. Yeah. But then I'm equating myself to the Buddha, so what an asshole! <laughs> I don't think the Buddha was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Sorry. No. Never miss a laugh, even if it's cheap. <clears throat> I, I was going to wait for the audience questions, but someone wants to know if you'll validate their parking. No. <laughs> I'm rather annoyed by that question. <laughs> We're going to tear it up. We're not having any more. <laughs> I, I'm looking at my questions for the first time. Um, <laughs> this evening. <laughs> that time you looked at that. You know? Yeah, I think so. Um, you said that uh, the two geniuses you met were Peter Sellers and James Burroughs. The, yes, and Peter Cook. And, and Peter, Peter Cook. Cook. James Burroughs was the director of Cheers, and he was the best I've ever worked with. An extraordinary thing was there would be last minute rewrites handed out just before the show. And when we had a read through in the dressing room with the new, uh, not a read through, uh, we would all do the lines but incorporating the new ones that had been suggested. He already knew the new lines better than the actors did. I don't know how he did it. Wow. And he's an absolute genius at knowing where to put the cameras and make it all work. He had a bad experience early on making a movie, and he said, I'm never going to make a movie again. And he just went on and made these great television shows. Wonderful shows. Peter, Peter uh, Sellers was the greatest comedy actor I ever saw. And if young people... Yeah, go <laughs> If young people don't, uh, don't know him, then you, uh, you must watch Dr. Strangelove. Yes! 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 I was just going to bring it up. But the greatest, one of the, the greatest comedy? I, I, it might be. I'm, every time I watch it, I'm laughing hysterically and I'm crying at the credits. Because yes. I'm so sad. Yes. And yes. that scene where Merkin Muffley, where he's the president, and he's on the phone with Dimitri telling him about the bomb... <laughs> and the camera doesn't move. And I was thinking, he did this 10 or 15 times that day yes, for Kubrick. True. And it's the most, per I mean, Bob Newhart, who I love, yeah. and invented that phone stand-up comedy. It is such a masterpiece when he's it's talking to It's wonderful, and it is, you know, the, su the subject is so serious. It is nuclear destruction of the world. And it's the most wonderful, wonderful. And he plays strange love, this strange... German rocket scientist. Yes. Whose arm, when he's talking, his arms <laughs> are going up. Sort and of like Mr. Hilter. Mr. Hilter. <laughs> and and uh, then he also plays an RAF officer. It's, it's extraordinary. And then Peter Cook, who was the greatest producer of comic material. Mm. And P the extraordinary thing about Peter was he was a genius because he didn't have to work at it. But it's very interesting because... When his genius ran out after 20 years, yeah. um, he didn't know how to grind it out like the rest of us. He couldn't do it. He, he went really went a long way downhill. In his so performance. all intuition. It was just, he could, if you wanted three minutes of funny material, you would just hold a microphone up to his mouth for three minutes. I mean, it was just extraordinary what he could do. Um, I'm astonished by the level of detail. You said writing this book, I've read an interview where you said writing the book was relatively easy and straightforward, but I'm uh, gobsmacked by the detail. I mean, how did you compile all of the timelines? There must have been a lot of Well, there was, there was a, a guy called James Curtis, who's a really marvelous writer, who's written a wonderful biography of Spencer Tracy, and before that at W.C. Fields. Um, and he was helping me with the timelines because he was so expert on that kind of research. And he dug up uh, reviews that Washington papers had done of shows I'd done for a week in a nightclub in 1965. I mean, he found this stuff everywhere. And it was incredibly helpful because sometimes you'd think, but that doesn't make sense. I can't have... And then you suddenly realize, oh, no, I did the show in Chicago. Then I went back to New York before I went to Washington. Just little things like that which clarify these puzzles that you come across when you can't figure out what happened in what direction. But you see, my experience of memory is that when I meet someone that I used to know very well, they will remember two stories about me in considerable detail, which I will have no <laughs> recollection of at all, and vice versa. Yeah. 
And yet I can tell them very specifically what happened, and they have no memory of it. And that happened yesterday. Somebody told me in great detail of something that had happened that had involved me when I was about 80. No recollection of it at all. And in fact, when I was doing a rather fun show in New York with four uh, fun women who sit on a sofa... Uh, the View. The View. Um, <laughs> Um, fun. They're fun. They showed, they're great fun, and they showed me a clip of a sketch, and I watched it, and I would have bet money that I'd never been in that sketch. <laughs> I, had, I had no recollection of it at all, and I sat there watching it, and just amazed that you could have forgotten something. But look, someone else wrote it, which is one of the reasons I probably didn't remember it. And then I rehearsed it for five days and recorded it, and that was probably 1969. So it's it, it, the memory. It, well, it seems to me that memories, you remember what's meaningful, and you forget the rest. So that if there was a, I tend to remember stories when there's a kind of moral at the end of them, a sort of Aesop tale moral at the a end. A moral for yourself. For, yes, or a point or a learning thing. Those are the kind of stories I tend to remember more than outright jokes. Well, so I mean. When you go back over this material and you comb through it, you must find other stories you totally forgot about yourself. Yeah, uh, and, and scripts that I'd forgotten. For example, I talk about a series here which I did with Marty Feldman and Graham Chapman and Tim Brooke Taylor, and I did it in 67. We did six shows in the spring and, and seven shows in the fall. And then after they'd been transmitted once, the Frost organization wiped the tape. Because the tapes in those days were about that big and that thick. And by the time you'd put 13 of them on a shelf, you were running, and most offices were running out of space. And they used to take them, <coughs> wipe them, and use them again for another program. Wow. Shows with Marty and me and Graham, and they just wiped them. Well, they're beginning, they're beginning to, to, to crop up. The Swedes found five compilation shows in a vault in Sweden. Dear Marty's uh, widow, Loretta, died last year and left me two tapes from her attic, two more shows. Wow. David's younger son, who's my godson, found two more shows just before the O2, including a last show, the last one we ever did, the 48 show it was called, which is so like a Monty Python that if I showed it to you guys now, you'd just be amazed. The only thing that's not Python is the faces, but the humor is exactly like Python. So it's very, it's very interesting when you discover this. And I mean, here, I, you, have you got a book? What's that? Have yes, you got a book? I do. You got one with you? I don't. Oh. I, le I left it in the car. Can, can, can we have his book? And we'll, we'll read a sketch together. That'll be All fun. right. Will you do Lovely. that? Lovely. Absolutely. Because it's... <laughs> It's probably we could get a book from someone in the front row, couldn't we? Has anyone got one they can lend us for a little bit? How are you going to get it to us? Ray! <laughs> Thank you. And don't think you're getting it back. <laughs> <clears throat> I, really, I really love this sketch. I shouldn't say that just before I... About to read it with you, but uh, hang on, hang on. At 295, I know it's because uh, I read it the other day. Now, I want you to play Graham Chapman. Okay. Because I'm sitting in an office, and it's a, it's a place that you go if you want to train your memory, if you want to get a better memory. So you come in, and I say, Come in. Ah, good morning. Come in. Thank you. Now, do sit down. What can I do for you? Well, I'm interested in your memory training program. Oh, good, good. Well, a lot of people feel they'd like to improve their memories. The wonderful thing is, improving them is not as hard as... Um... <laughs> it's not as hard as, 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 as nails. I beg oh, your pardon? It's not as hard as nails. It's word association. You see, it's the basis of my system. You remember things <coughs> by associating with... Um, uh, with, uh, with people like that. People like what? They like to improve their memory. Now, what can I do for you? I'm interested in your course. Good. You remember that, you see. You have learned... <laughs> you have learned to associate your interest in my course with my asking why. 
See, it's an association of ideas, the basis of everything that we do to acquire a better memory. And it's not as, not as hard as... Um, I, I think. No, not as hard as nails, remember? <laughs> never mind, never mind, you'll soon pick it up. Now, take a common object like this. A saucer. Good, well done. <laughs> now, what does it make you think of? Uh, well... Well, what would you like to think of? <sighs> like to think of... Nude woman? A nude woman? A nude woman, well done. <laughs> You're getting it. What is, the nude, what is the nude woman doing? Drinking tea. Good. And what's she drinking tea out of? A cup. Quite right. A cup and saucer. It's a saucer, you see. You getting it? I'm not sure. Well, one of the association ideas that is the basis of our method, in fact, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole in the wall, and um, <laughs> what do I see through the hole in the wall? A, a nude woman. <laughs> Every time. Every time. Of course, it's such a strong image, you see, you can't forget it. You associate it with anything that you want to remember. Anything. Numbers, dates, names, anything. Just, just try again. Uh, Battle of Trafalgar. Oh, Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square, square, hole in the wall, look through the hole in the wall. What do I see? A nude woman. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> and who is this nude woman? I don't know. The Empress Josephine, 1815. See, it rhymes. Josephine, 1815. 1815 was Waterloo. Trafalgar was 1805. Yes, but wait, wait a minute. I haven't finished yet. Joseph... <laughs> Josephine's wearing boots, Wellington boots. You see, you can't see the toes, so deduct the <laughs> 10 that you can't see from 1850. 1805, simple. Right, the date of Waterloo. 1815. Yes, but how do you do it? Wait a moment, Waterloo, Waterloo, Waterloo Station. Waterloo Station, train, train to Brighton, Brighton Pier, Peer through the hole in the wall. <laughs> and there's the Empress Josephine in the nude 1815. But she's got Wellington boots on. No, no, Battle of Waterloo, Duke of Wellington, and he comes, wants his boots back, so he sees her toes, no need to deduct 10. Waterloo 1815. Fire of London? Uh, what? The date of the fire of London. Oh, let me think, let me think. Date of the fire in London. Fire, fiery, fiery, Samuel Pepys. Yes, Pepys wrote in his famous diary about the fire in London. Samuel Pepys, Pepys threw the hole in the wall. <laughs> <clears throat> and what does he see? A nude woman. No, no, three nude women. By the light of the fire, he sees three stunning, gorgeous nude women. Sex, 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 sixteen, sixty, sex. <laughs> you see, well, it, it, it's quite exciting for me to think that we wrote that back in 1967. Yeah. And that could easily have been a Python sketch, you know? And the lovely thing is, as, as we recover it, I want to take that material and make it into another show. Oh, that's and I great. don't know whether to make it a, very, a sort of modern kind of way of linking it all together or to keep it old-fashioned or whether it should be television or stage. But my, my lovely PA, Howard, is actually working on recovering all the material. And it keeps cropping up on the Internet. It's extraordinary. He'll suddenly find, he found a bit recently, it was 10 seconds or something that we didn't know about on the Internet. But it gave us a clue as to where, should we, where, where we should be looking. Now, did you choose farce as a comedic style, or did it just choose you? It chose me. It, was, it just chose me. I realized that it was when things got absurd when they went past a certain level of wildness, that was when I laughed the most. And I slowly began to see that it was, it was uh, what we call farce. And the, 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 the thing about farce is, is that there's usually a moment at the start. The protagonist in most of the famous farces I've ever come across is male. So let's assume it's a chap, because it's more likely to happen with men. They get more wound up in a strange kind of way. 
So uh, he does something at the start which he's got to hide, you know, because it's usually about a taboo, and he's broken the taboo and he has to try and hide. It's very often to do with sexual infidelity in the great French farces of mm -hmm. sort of 1890. And what happens is that as he tries to cover it up, it gets, his, his attempts to cover it up don't quite work, and then he, the, the, the attempts to cover up get wilder and wilder and wilder and wilder. And it's that sort of emotional wildness when people get completely frantic, like Basil Fawlty. That's what makes me laugh more than people swapping jokes. Yeah. You know that that's one of the things that Kubrick said when he was writing yeah. Dr. Strangelove, right. that he was originally writing it based on the material from the book Failsafe, and he was writing a serious movie, but every time he took a scene to its natural, natural conclusion, it was funny. Yeah. And so halfway through the process, he called up Terry Southern and he said, we've got to make this a comedy. I didn't know Terry Southern wrote it. He Terry Southern? I got that right, yeah? Yeah, yeah Terry Southern. I didn't know. He yeah, he co-wrote it with Kubrick. Well, I don't. <laughs> no, that's fascinating to me. I didn't know that. But it, 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 is, it is strange because I remember somebody said um, to Arthur Miller, do you think life is a farce or a tragedy? And he said, I'm not sure, he said, but on the whole, I tend to think it's a farce. And I think it's a much healthier attitude <clears throat> to go through life just saying, we've no idea what we're doing, we're all idiots, um, we're <laughs> all getting it wrong, um, nobody, nobody knows what they're talking about, just occasionally you come across one person like Richard Feynman, who in one area knows what he's talking about, all the rest is bullshit. <laughs> Wall to wall bullshit. People <laughs> pretending that they, you see, I came across this wonderful bit of research. I'm a phony professor at Cornell, and I, and I, I or at least I used to be before the alimony. Um, I, haven't been, I haven't been back for some time because I can't afford to take the time off, but there's a fellow there called David Dunning, and he's been interested all his life in self-assessment, how good people are at knowing how good they are at doing things. Oh, right, the Dunning-Kruger right? effect. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And what he's discovered is that in order to know how good you are at something requires almost exactly the same aptitudes as it does to be good at that thing in the first place, which follows as a corollary that if you're absolutely no good at something, you lack exactly the skills that you need. <laughs> That you're no good at it. That you're no good at it. And once you realize that there's thousands of people out there who have no idea what they're doing and they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not tragedy material, I think. I think this is... And the only disappointing thing is that at the end we die. I think that's the one thing that's hard to... Uh, to well, maybe there's a laugh we don't know about. Maybe there's a laugh we don't know about. I, I'm interested in one bit of research done by <clears throat> people interested in the paranormals. A woman called... Oh, I've forgotten her name. She's up at IONS. And she does paranormal experiments with an English guy whose name is something like Whiteman or some name like that. And when the two of them together, if she does the experiments, they appear to work. And when he does them, with her watching, they don't. <laughs> now, I think that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering when, if when we die, what happens is what we think is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So I, you're not going to have an afterlife, are you? I, it would be nice. It would be but nice. I, I don't, don't expect don't, you one, don't no. Think, no. No. I have a feeling that there will be one. So you see, I won't be seeing you there because... <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Castaneda says in one of his books, uh, his teacher, Don Juan, tells him, no, it turns out there is no point to any of this. No, no point at all. There is a thing that gives us our consciousness. It is hard and cold and we refer to it as the eagle because that's what it reminds us of but it is something that gives birth to our consciousness and then when we die it eats us back up again and Castaneda says well what's the point he says there is no point but as a thanks for this brief period of sentience 
we try and expand our consciousness while we're here uh. because it makes a particularly delicious meal for the eagle. Ah. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I love that. That's, that's as good as, it's all been most interesting. <laughs> I, like the, I like the grammarian who, as they were dying, I can't remember who it was, but apparently they said, I am going to, or I am about to die. Either is correct. <laughs> My favorite one, which, is, which was an English practical joker in the 20s who had a private income, and he used to amuse himself with practical jokes, and he lived in a, <clears throat> a very small but beautiful flat right off Piccadilly Circus. And he lived above, above a very famous um, French fish restaurant called Prunier's. And one day, <clears throat> he had a heart attack, and the ambulance arrived and, and discovered that the steps up to his little flat at the top of Prunier's were so steep that they couldn't bring him down it on a stretcher, and they had to use an emergency exit, which meant that he had to be carried out through the restaurant. <laughs> and as he was carried out through the restaurant, dying, he raised himself up on one elbow and said, oh, no. Don't eat the halibut. <laughs> 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 There's a local resident near here, Steve Wozniak, co-inventor of the oh, Apple computer. Yeah. Do you know yeah. about his practical jokes with money? No. He buys uncut sheets of bills from the U.S. Mint, and then he does things with them, like he has them laminated into a checkbook so that when he wants to pay you with a 20, he tears it out by perforation. <laughs> His whole goal is to convince you that he's giving you money he just printed. So he'll also <laughs> have them put on rolls, or he'll just pull out the sheet and use a pair of scissors to cut you out $40. <laughs> now there's a good way to use a lot of money. Exactly. That's exactly what billionaires should be doing. Oh, absolutely. They should be having, you know, we, we've rather lost, lost practical jokes, haven't we? Well, they, the, one of the problems with practical jokes is they get mean really quickly. Yes. And it takes real intelligence to do a practical joke that's not mean. Yeah. Because mean's easy. Mean is easy. But to do one which is just a, a really glorious, benevolent, attempt to completely waste someone else's time. <laughs> I, I, I always wanted to do a, a, a hidden camera show where someone would wake up and it was 1934. <laughs> where everything was just slightly wrong. That's the what... windows were five inches smaller than they were the previous day, and they can't quite figure out. The glasses are 10% too small. The cleverest practical joke I ever heard was from a French poet in, in, in Paris in about 1870, 1880, and he lived on his own in a block of flats, and there was a concierge, a nice old lady, and he was very fond of her. And one day he was out on a walk, and he saw a pet shop, and he just wandered in. He didn't know what he was doing, and he saw this dear little turtle, and he thought, I'm going to buy it as a present for her. And he bought the little turtle and a little bowl of water and so forth and took it back to her. And she was so thrilled. She couldn't stop talking about the fucking thing. So after a time, he had a brilliant idea. He waited till she was out. And he, he went and got the turtle, took it back to the pet shop, and swapped it for a slightly bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> took it back, and she was so excited. The next day she said, oh, look, look how well he's doing. Look at him. <laughs> and he kept on doing this, which is every week he'd go and swap it. But getting bigger and bigger, and then the genius. He started making it smaller. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. It puts a whole different slant on scientific inquiry, doesn't it? Yes, it does. That's right, yeah. 
Um, I, I think it's time to start asking some questions okay. for, from the audience. Here. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, what would you be doing today if not for Monty Python? Ooh, what an interesting question. If not for Monty Python, I don't know I, what I'd really oh. like to be doing is uh, I'd like to make documentaries about things that I really don't understand, which would be humorous. <laughs> they yep. would be really humorous. I'd love to make a documentary about what religion would have been if the churches hadn't fucked it up. <laughs> you see, I think that would be yeah. interesting, you see? What is, what is mystical experience? You know, what, what is it? What is it about? Why do, why do people find it so extraordinarily emotionally powerful? And yet, why does it always fall into the hands of people who then basically turn it on its head? Because I think it's very hard to justify, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, you know. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you were there in, in, a, in an auto da fe in, in, in Seville, in what would it be, about 1560? If around, you say so. Around, well, counter-revolution around that. And, uh, and, and uh, there they are, burning heretics, you know. And you can imagine Christ arriving and, and, and right. saying to one of the, the Inquisition people, could you explain what you're doing? Why are you burning these people alive? Because they're in great pain. And he would say, well, you see, we, are, we, we discovered that they have a different interpretation from us of your gospel of love. <laughs> yeah. And in America, I mean, in some extraordinary way, Christianity is because sort of overlaps with capitalism. You, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, it's all real estate. It's all real estate and huge quantities of money being generated by preachers. Now, I want to say, no, 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 no. I don't think he said, blessed are the rich. So it's fascinating. Somebody once said that an idea is not responsible for the people who hold it. <laughs> and I think that's very, very accurate. So I'd like to do that, and I'd like to do a documentary about why very, very rich people need to be very, very rich unless they want to play practical jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I find myself wondering about that, too. Why do, why do they need so much? I remember I said to someone in, in Santa Barbara once, the funny thing about the very rich is how greedy they are, that they still want more. And he said, no, 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 no. They're, they're, they're rich because they're so greedy. In other words, they're not really affected by the money coming in. That is the personality type. Right. With. They just keep, they're, they're continuing to attempt That's to right. satisfy them. That's people. right. And a psychiatrist said a beautiful thing to me about a year ago in London. He said, if you want to think what, if you want to understand what God thinks about money, look at the people he gives it to. <laughs> <laughs> I had dinner with a clinical psychologist whose specialty, he's British, was studying lottery winners. And oh. in the UK over there, they just give you the whole amount. I didn't know that. And he said he had yet in 10 years of studying them to find one person whose life wasn't ruined by winning the lottery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Speaking of money, were Pink Floyd happy with their investment in Holy Grail? Yes, I think they were. <laughs> Because that was the first time we ever made any money. You know, working in, in English television, we wanted to work for the BBC, but the money was extraordinarily small. I know we're talking about 69 and 70, but, but, but for doing seven and a half months' work, writing, um, performing, filming, editing, uh, 13 shows, a series of 13, we used to get about 4,000 pounds. And when it was shown in New York, we used to get one quarter of 1% of the original fee, where the original fee was 240 pounds a show. So 1% of that is two pounds and 40 P. <laughs> a quarter of that is 60 P. So if they showed 13 shows, uh, 66, three, uh, we would get 78 P. I mean, $7.80p. Now, it's not a lot of money for a whole television series, is it? No. And when we were making Life of... I uh, know, making uh, a Holy Grail, we were paid £4,000 for the whole thing. 2000 uh, before it started, and then they rang us up. 
and said, uh, we'll pay, we can't pay you the other two yet, but we'll hope to pay it to you in a couple of months. And then the producer said, would you mind very much sharing hotel rooms? <laughs> and I, think it, I don't think anyone ever asked Paul Newman to share a, a hotel room, you know? Except Paul Newman. Except Paul Newman, yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Someone wants to know what's the inspiration for Venezuelan beaver cheese. Well, I, I was trying to come up with silly cheeses, and I came up with some more when we did the uh, we did the O2. Incidentally, there's a DVD of it out, and it should be worth looking at because there were some wonderful moments when we broke up uh, that were that were just utterly, utterly special. And I, where you broke, where you cracked each other, we cracked up. each other up, and then it was just, it was just wonderful to have that freedom and to know. You see, uh, what happened was on the second night. You know Eddie Izzard, yes, brilliant, wonderful. He came to seven of the shows. <clears throat> you believe that he came to seven of the shows, and on the second night, a very weird thing happened. We started off with a silly Spanish number and guitars. And then we went into white tuxedos and talked about these, these businessmen, who, uh, Yorkshire businessmen, yeah. the four Yorkshiremen, and we'd get competitive about how tough their lives had been, <laughs> you know? And we were halfway through the sketch, and I was mainly listening to, to, to um, Michael on my right and Eric on my left, and I glanced over at Terry Jones, and he had blood running down the side of his face, but it was the side away from the audience. And I thought, what the hell? What had happened was, when he'd taken his guitar off in a hurry, because it was second night and we were still rushing, he cut his eye and it bled profusely. The next time I look at him, he'd done that because he thought there was something there. And he had r a red hand. <laughs> and I blew a couple of lines. You know, I said the wrong thing. And I saw Eddie backstage uh, about 10 minutes later. He was just wandering around. And I said, sorry about blowing the line. Uh, you know, just, I don't know why I bothered. But he, he said, no, no, you don't get it. And I said, what? And he said, the most important thing to me that anyone said for 10 years, he said, you, but you've got to realize it. they've seen you do it right countless times. It's much more special when something happens that's never happened before. Yeah. And he was right. So it's the opposite of what a theatrical performance is supposed to be about. It becomes a completely other kind of animal. Uh, and the, the, the sheer... The sheer goodwill and happiness in that arena was an extraordinary thing to experience. And I suddenly, I know this will surprise people, I suddenly thought, maybe entertainers are important after all. <laughs> because the, to see that, you know? Yeah. And it, because it was bringing people together, and I was on a TV show four weeks ago in London with Neil Diamond, and the same feeling happened when they were all singing Sweet Caroline, yeah. right? And suddenly, I just looked at this audience and everyone was having a good time. And there was some, I thought, this is good. There's no question, this is good. Agreed. I think that's a fine place to finish. Okay. John, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.